The 42nd Annual National Water Well Association Convention and Exposition was held in Anaheim, California, September 23rd through the 26th, 1990. A highlight of the annual convention is the keynote presentation given by the Darcy Lecturer. The Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecturer Program is sponsored by the Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers. The association annually chooses an individual to be offered as a visiting lecturer to a number of universities in North America. This program honors the historical discovery by Henry Darcy in 1856, which established the physical basis on which groundwater hydrology has been studied for more than a century. In 1948, Ralph Carr Heath received his bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He began his career as a geologist with the groundwater branch of the U.S. Geological Survey in Florida. In 1955, Ralph Heath was appointed geologist in charge of the upstate New York groundwater program in Albany. From 1960 to 1965, he served as district geologist for New York and southern New England, and in 1965 was appointed first district chief for New York. He transferred to Raleigh to assume the duties of district chief of North Carolina in 1967, a position he held until 1981 when he became staff hydrologist for the U.S. Geological Survey. In 1982, he was appointed adjunct professor of civil engineering by North Carolina State University and currently holds that position and the position of lecturer at Duke University. Mr. Heath's accomplishments are many and varied. As an authority on the geology of the Atlantic Coast states, he has designed, supervised, and played a major role in the investigation of major programs of water study. His leadership and investigative qualities are seen in his numerous technical and scientific papers. Ralph Heath exercises a strong personal devotion to the advancement of groundwater hydrologists in many different ways, as a teacher, through one-on-one -on -one associations, and through active participation on professional organizations that share his commitment. Mr. Heath's focus will be hydrology and hazardous waste disposal. We have here uh, a plaque in uh, recognition of your uh, work, and we appreciate your time very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Warren. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I thought earlier today while I was having lunch back there in the back that this was going to be the smallest audience I had had this year. And I was thinking that it's terrible to have to come all the way to Anaheim to, to talk to the smallest audience, but you build up some, and I'm, I'm appreciative of that. I would like to also uh, note at the beginning that uh, the article on the Darcy Lecture prepared by Gloria Swanson that appeared in the uh, convention news this morning did not contain any erroneous uh, quotes of, uh, for me. Uh, it's an outstanding article, the best I've ever seen in it. Every quote was correct. So if you don't agree with the quotes, at least they were the correct ones that uh, Gloria reported. The Darcy Lecture Series has made this a busy year, and October, my busiest month, uh, is close at hand. Uh, you're going to hear some different numbers now about the lectures. I have uh, lectured so far at 11 universities uh, in around the country. I have two uh, lectures scheduled during this trip at universities here in the uh, Los Angeles area. Uh, but that is before I return to Raleigh. I will uh, make my final and 19th lecture at the University of North Carolina on November 16. I have, will have lectured then at 18 universities and the National Convention here. At most universities, I have not only presented the Darcy Lecture, but I've also talked on one or two other of my favorite topics. So by the end of my tour, I will have uh, presented something like 50 lectures to about 1,500 people, not counting this audience today. With airfares and other costs, the Darcy Lecture represents a significant expenditure of the AGWSC. Uh, I think, however, it is a good investment both for the uh, division and also for groundwater. It's not only an honor to be selected as the Darcy Lecturer, but also a great experience. Uh, you meet, in the course of these lectures, some very interesting people, like, for example, the lady at Lamar University at Beaumont, Texas, who, after I had finished the lecture and we were in the discussion period, uh, she kind of 
kept squirming around in her chair, and I knew she had something on her mind. And finally, she uh, got up enough nerve to ask me, and her question was, are you serious? <laughs> now, you, you may see in a few minutes uh, why she asked the question. And then there was a young student at Bates College uh, in Maine a couple of weeks ago who said in effect, or who asked in effect, uh, how did we get, how in the world did we get in the fix we're in with uh, our waste, or the mess we're in? Now the answer, of course, is too many people producing too much waste. Because of time, I'm going to present a somewhat abbreviated version of my Darcy lecture today. The complete unexpurgated uh, version will be uh, delivered at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, next Monday afternoon, and also at California State of Los Angeles next Tuesday evening. Today, however, I will discuss three topics. The first topic that I will discuss is the magnitude of the hazardous waste problem in the United States. Second, our secure hazardous waste disposal sites. And third, hydrogeologic factors and hazardous waste disposal. I must note at the beginning that, has, that I include in hazardous waste sites municipal sanitary landfills. Treating municipal sanitary landfills as hazardous waste disposal sites may surprise some of you, but EPA in its 1988 report to Congress on solid waste disposal in the U.S. noted the increasing concern about leachate from uh, sanitary landfills. To determine that concern was justified, EPA measured the concentration of eight selected toxic constituents in sanitary landfill leachate and found them present in concentrations large enough to be a health problem to individuals who drank water containing or containing that leachate or contaminated with it. So that's why I include municipal sanitary landfills in my consideration of hazardous waste. To set the stage for my talk, we first need to consider the magnitude of the hazardous waste problem in the U.S. The rate of generation of waste that include hazardous components is very imperfectly known at best. The currently accepted estimates are that we produce about 160 million tons per year of municipal waste, that is, the waste going to sanitary landfills, and 86 million tons of industrial waste for a total of 246 million tons per year. These wastes are disposed of in 9,300 plus municipal and industrial landfills, which together occupy areas totaling more than 1,200 square miles. If we include the area down gradient into which the leachate has moved, we obviously are thinking of an area more than two or three times the size of the state of Rhode Island. Another unit I think is of interest is the volume of landfill waste generated each year. That is, how much space is occupied by the 246 million tons of waste that goes to landfills. Compacted landfill waste weighs about 25 pounds per cubic foot, and 246 million tons weighs 490 billion pounds. Dividing by 25, we obtain 20 billion cubic feet. If we assume the average thickness of waste is 30 feet based on data from North Carolina, we find that the area filled with hazardous waste each year is about 15,300 acres or 24 square miles. Generating a pile of hazardous waste each year, 30 feet deep, that covers an area of 24 square miles, certainly puts our hazardous waste disposal problem in a better perspective than any number I can think of. Clearly, we must reduce the rate of waste generation, and EPA issued regulations in 1984 to start reducing the generation of industrial waste. These regulations are intended in time to eliminate the need for hazardous waste disposal sites. Going back even further, concern about hazardous waste disposal and groundwater pollution led Congress in 1976 to pass the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, referred to by EPA with the acronym RECRA. This act covered the disposal of both hazardous and non-hazardous waste. As the magnitude and the dangers associated with groundwater pollution became better known, Congress in 1980 passed the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, which is known to EPA by the acronym CIRCLAR and known to everyone else as Superfund. The person who coined the name Superfund should be knighted, as the Queen does in England, because to paraphrase Winston Churchill, seldom has so much money been spent so unwisely to accomplish so little. 
The only possible exceptions I can think of are some of the weapons systems purchased by the Department of Defense. Those of you who have not done so should read the guest editorial by Friesen Cherry in Groundwater, July, August 1989, entitled What Has Gone Wrong? That was followed in November, December by a comment on that editorial by Kasman. And then the Newsweek uh, issue of November 27, 1989, titled Buried Alive. One of the provisions of Superfund is that abandoned hazardous waste sites that are polluting groundwater can be cleaned up by EPA and the responsible parties bill for the expense. This got the attention of industries that produce hazardous waste and the engineering community immediately began designing secure hazardous waste disposal sites. Secure are those sites that will never pollute groundwater, and to be sure that's the case, monitoring wells must be sampled for 30 years after site closure. The word secure should be in quotes because, as you will see, I don't think these sites are really secure. A secure landfill has these design features. First, it has thick, clay and plastic liners for the bottom and sides, which are shown on this slide in black. That's the, the compacted thick clay liners for the bottom and sides, and the, the purple are the plastic liners. Second, it has a gravel layer containing leachate collection pipes, so that we have the leachate collection pipes and the gravel layer under the waste. And third, compatible wastes are placed in cells surrounded by earth barriers, so that each of our different colored ways here are presumably surrounded by earth barriers so that we're keeping non-compatible ways from mixing. The secure site also has a plastic cover overlaying by sand and a thin layer of clay and a layer of topsoil all nicely mounted above the land surface. This is our topsoil, the clay, and the sand layer. It also has two monitoring wells down gradient, down the groundwater gradient, and one monitoring well up gradient. And so we have one well down gradient and one well up, but there'd be another down gradient well. And sixth, it has the requirement that the monitoring wells will be sampled for 30 years after closure. The plastic and clay liners, together with the leachate collection system, are intended to prevent groundwater pollution so that theoretically, a secure landfill can be located any place any place that land use zoning will permit, including the center of groundwater recharge areas. Let's consider some of the potential weaknesses of this design. Filling sites with waste may extend over a period of many years, so we should ask ourselves, will the clay liner remain intact, or will desiccation cracks form during dry periods? And will the plastic liners be torn during installation and waste and placement? How successful is the, is the segregation of non-compatible wastes? And to try to indicate that we're dealing here with non-compatible wastes, we have changed the colors of the waste uh, uh, cells. Relative to the segregation of non-compatible wastes, recent fires at hazardous waste sites in the southern U.S. have been blamed by the operators on improperly labeled wastes. I would also note parenthetically here that uh, I doubt that we know which of all these complex chemicals we're dealing with are compatible and which ones aren't. In many cases, we don't even know which ones are toxic and which ones aren't. Next point, will the leachate collection system function as intended, or will it be collapsed by equipment used to emplace the waste, or will the pipes corrode, or will the holes be filled with sediment or chemical precipitates form when the wastes react with each other? Assume that the leachate collection system works perfectly. What do we do with the leachate? We can build an on-site incinerator and treatment plant, or we can pump it in a tank truck and take it to the nearest municipal uh, uh, sewage treatment plant. Or the third, and by far the cleverest of all the uh, solutions, is we can pump the leachate back into the top of the cell and hope that it disappears on the next passage through. <laughs> now, all of these solutions have been and are being used. Next point, is the cap fail safe? Or will it erode and become permeable through decaying root holes and animal burrows? Note that the cap is thin and mounted above land surface. That is, the impermeable part, the clay, is mounted above land surface. 
Will depressions form on it as the waste compact and drums corrode and collapse? Or will it be maintained more than 30 years after closure? In fact, will it even be maintained 15 years? Will the pollution monitoring wells detect groundwater pollution? Or will they be in the wrong direction or screened to the wrong depths? Will sampling be continued for 30 years? Or will the original owner be bankrupt and in some other business? And then, the final and possibly most horrifying question, what happens when the liner remains intact and both the cap and the leachate collection system fail? This question is especially pertinent for waste sites are located in groundwater recharge areas. And for those of you uh, who are familiar with the West Valley, uh, Western New York Nuclear Service Center, you know that it's this kind of problem that uh, happened at that site. These questions that I have uh, raised are not exhaustive, but they at least focus attention on potential weaknesses. However, before leaving the topic of secure landfills, I want to return to the topic of selection of, uh, selection of secure sites. I noted earlier that because of confidence in their design, it is assumed they can be located any place, including the center of groundwater recharge areas. In fact, the center of recharge areas seems to be the preferred location because these are also the farthest from streams. As you know by now, I think we need to carefully reconsider the design of these sites. I especially think the location of these sites is a critical issue. In fact, if we ignore this issue, future generations are likely to have some unpleasant surprises. I have adopted here from uh, Dr. Toth two of his idealized flow diagrams which deal with homogeneous and isotropic conditions. The upper diagram deals with an undissected lake plain and the red vertical lines are lines of equal head or equal potential lines. The blue lines are lines of groundwater flow lines so that groundwater gets in the ground and moves along the path of the flow line to discharge at the trunk stream over on the left side of the drawing. In the undissected lake plain, we can pretty well predict what the route of groundwater movement will be, again, with our homogeneous and isotropic conditions, so that we can have waste cells any place on this upland and, and pretty well figure the route that the waste would take. Where the surprise will come, and, and this is the more common situation, is in hilly areas, in this case a hilly upland, but again, remember we're dealing with a homogeneous and isotropic condition and these are rather unusual conditions, as all the hydrogeologists in the room know. What we have in this case, of course, are the local flow cells, and then we also have regional flow lines coming from the, the center of the recharge area all the way over to the regional groundwater discharge point. Waste cells at different places in here, in, in this kind of area, will be the ones that cause the surprises in the future. And this is especially true when we consider the anisotropy of groundwater systems, not the ideal situation that we have here. A third example concerns areas such as the Piedmont province in the eastern U.S. that are underlain by fractured rocks. There is little opportunity for waste solutions to reach the fractures to be beneficially modified or altered. Therefore, the best policy, of course, is to keep waste out of these fractures. This is not likely if waste sites are placed in the center of interstream areas. And I have shown on this sketch here two waste sites. This is the preferred location on the, uh, on the middle of the interstream area. And when we locate sites there, we have the opportunity not only to pollute the groundwater system all the way over to this stream, but also the stream over on the left It's not shown. An alternative, of course, would be to place the site closer to the stream so that we're polluting less of the groundwater and only one stream. It seems appropriate to end this topic and introduce the next and final topic with a quotation from the Freeze and Cherry editorial in Groundwater, and that is, study after study has shown that the best route to clean groundwater is through good hydrogeological siting, not clever engineering design. And then, as our leader, Jay Lair, said in a, uh, edi an editorial after that, I uh, think dealing with the San Antonio water situation, there are, in fact, few supporters of low-cost solutions to water problems. So where are we now? We have designed and built, at great expense, secure landfills for hazardous waste that are not secure because of design flaws and failure to adequately consider hydrogeology. In the meantime, the presidents presence of hazardous waste substances and municipal waste 
and the groundwater pollution being caused by sanitary landfills is resulting in the adoption one by one of the design features now used in secure sites. Recognizing the flaws in the secure landfill design, is this the answer? I think not, uh, but what's the alternative? The alternative, I think, is to carefully consider both hydrogeology and topographic setting in the selection of all municipal and industrial waste sites. I will therefore devote the remainder of my remarks to the hydrogeologic, topographic, and design considerations that should be involved in the selection and development of waste disposal sites. To do this, I will first discuss the goals of waste site selection and suggest how these goals can be met in large parts of the country. Obviously, I must deal with ideal situations and general concepts and not with specific sites. There are, as I see it, five goals we want to accomplish at hazardous waste disposal sites. These are, first, avoid unacceptable groundwater and or surface water pollution. Unacceptable in this case means pollution that would affect present or potential uses of the water. Second, we want to enhance chemical and biological breakdown of the waste. Waste in this sense are products we no longer can use so that we have no reason to preserve them. However, until they decay into harmless products, they have, to be, they have the potential to cause problems and must be watched at significant continuing expense. Three, we want to prevent leachate production at unacceptable rates. In order to achieve this goal, the entry of water into waste cells must be strictly controlled. Four, we want to immobilize harmful leachate constituents. Leachate is the cause of most groundwater and surface water pollution. Therefore, immobilizing harmful constituents in the leachate, including metals and complex organics, is of critical importance in meeting our first goal. Five, we want to dilute harmful effluent to harmless concentrations. The production of leachate at harmless levels is desirable because, together with goal number two, that is the chemical and biological breakdown, it reduces the period over which waste can cause problems. How can we meet these goals? Returning to goal number one, avoiding unacceptable groundwater and surface water pollution, the best, if not the only way to avoid groundwater pollution is to locate waste sites in or adjacent to groundwater discharge areas. In the humid parts of the country, this means that waste sites must be located adjacent to perennial streams. I want to return to this, uh, to the topic of surface water pollution in goal number three. Goal number two, enhancing chemical and biological breakdown of waste. This is best accomplished by placing waste at sites with a deep depth to the water table. As leachate percolates across the unsaturated zone, it is in contact with oxygen, which aids oxidation and bacterial action. Also, recent research has shown the value of providing extra nutrients to encourage bacterial action on some waste. Finding deep depth to the water table in the eastern or humid half of the country requires careful consideration of both hydrogeology and topography. Considering both the first and second goals together, where in the humid areas can we find sites near groundwater discharge areas which also have a large depth to the water table? Such sites occur in at least four topographic situations. The first would be on remnants of terraces, old river terraces. Second one, on the upland adjacent to major streams, where the position of the water table is controlled by the stream here and of course by the nature of the geology. But we would sense that if the geology is not unusual, we would have a greater depth of water table near that break in slope than we would have if we went further inland where the water table is getting closer to the land surface. And third, even on the edge of the floodplain itself, if we are willing to build up the area to get the uh, depth of unsaturated material that we're looking for and surround that area with a dike. You'll note that I have placed this uh, waste cell here on the side of the valley as far away from the stream as possible and the area where the flood flows, the velocities during floods would be the, the smallest. Those are three of the sites that I think we could find in the humid east. And then my favorite site, located on the peninsula between a major stream and a tributary. Here we have a major stream and a tributary joining it. And on that peninsula, it seems to me to be an ideal place for waste sites, waste cells. The position of the water table is controlled by the two nearby streams, and we have the groundwater flow lines shown uh, with blue there. 
All these areas, except the floodplain location, tend to have, as I've said, a relatively large depth to the water table because the water table gradient is towards the streams. This is a fortunate situation because the areas are, are in or near groundwater discharge areas so that we largely avoid groundwater pollution. Conditions in large parts of the West are both different and more complex than those in the East. For example, in large parts of the West, streams function as intermittent line sources of groundwater uh, recharge rather than as lines of groundwater discharge. In these areas, it would be counterproductive to put waste sites near the streams. Other parts of the West are, from the standpoint of hydrogeology, ideal for hazardous waste disposal. One type of such areas are the internally drained, hydrologically isolated basins. The depth of the water table can be quite large in parts of these areas, and water reaching the land surface evaporates in the, in the Playa Lakes in the center of the basins. Moving on to goal number three, that is to prevent leachate production at unacceptable rates. An unacceptable rate of leachate production is the rate at which the chemical and biological reactions in the unsaturated zone are overwhelmed, that is, those reactions cease, and or the rate at which pollution of streams affects beneficial use of those waters, including biological aspects too. The key to preventing leachate generation is to prevent the entry of water. The best way to ensure this is to first place the waste in the unsaturated zone so groundwater cannot enter the waste cell through the bottom and sides. Second, surround the site with a dike and cut off ditch to intercept overland flow or, or lateral movement through the soil zone. But overland flow has, for example, during periods when the ground is frozen, if we're dealing with areas in the northern part of the country. Third is to cover the site with a thick impermeable cap that extends <coughs> below the original land surface. You remember on the secure site, we had a thin clay layer mounted above the land surface. In this design here, we have a thick compacted clay cap that actually extends below the land surface. Then, of course, we have to have the soil zone above that to, to get the grass to grow. And the dike and the, uh, and the cutoff ditch. The last point related to this slide is that we want to maintain that cap as long as hazardous waste hazardous waste remains in the cell. Now these requirements differ from those for the secure sites which provide for a thin mound-shaped cap that is maintained only for a short period following closure. Before leaving this slide, I want to specifically call your attention to the fact that this waste cell is placed in an area underlain by silty clay, which has a large ion exchange capacity. I'll return to that point uh, in just a moment. The uh, fourth goal is to immobilize harmful leachate constituents. This goal obviously assumes that regardless of efforts to exclude water from the site, some leachate will be produced from liquids disposed of in the, in the site if from no other source. From an operational standpoint, it is desirable that harmless leachate components be permitted to escape and that harmful components be immobilized, be tied up in some way. Most harmful substances are either metals or complex organics. Both of these tend to be tied up on organic carbonaceous material or on clays and silts by ion exchange. Therefore, we want to either locate waste cells in areas underlain by silty clay, as in the previous slide, or if such areas are not present, to line our waste cell with a layer of silty clay. What we want is not an impermeable layer, but one that is semi-permeable with sufficient ion exchange capacity to immobilize the volume of harmful constituents that are likely to be produced. Relative to the importance of ion exchange, a couple of years ago, and this has been mentioned in the introduction, I was involved in a problem related to groundwater pollution caused by a coal-fired power plant ash pond. The power plant is located in the Piedmont uh, uh, region of North Carolina, an area underlain by unconsolidated surficial materials derived from weathering of crystalline fractured rock. Uh, these these materials are what